Hi, I'm Stephanie Strange. Want to hear something scary? Hey, Strangelines. I hope you all had a great start to the new year. We are excited for 2024, and we're starting off right with a compilation, so enjoy. I live in Jamaica. Here, everyone has ghost stories, or as we call them, duppy stories. My obsession with duppy began when I was 11, when I was at my grandma's funeral. There was nobody in attendance except me, my little sisters, Tanya and Nina, my mom, and my uncle, Louis. They lowered my grandma's coffin into the ground, and my uncle placed an upside-down shrub on the coffin, roots pointed up. I looked up at my mom, who was staring intently at the grave. Mom, what is that? She was stone-faced and said nothing. My uncle Lewis put his hand on my shoulder. Little Chan, when people die, the good soul goes up to heaven and the bad soul stays in the ground. After three days, the bad soul's shadow rises up and walks the earth as a duppy. He continued, if the shrub faces down, the shadow gets confused and stays put. But if the shrub faces right side up, he shook his head and clicked his tongue. My mother became enraged. Stop telling her that shit, she hissed. From that day on, Duppy were all I could think about. I followed my Uncle Lewis around, asking him to tell me more Duppy stories. Duppy? He laughed. They're as real as me or you, but they're all bad. They're mean. They can grab you, hurt you, or worse. Don't look for Duppy, and never ever invite a Duppy to come to you. But are there any cute Duppy? I asked. You wouldn't like them. They stink of death, and they have no face. Just wide, grinning teeth. He made a scary face and I screamed. Then we both laughed hysterically. The next day, I skipped through the graveyard carrying a basket of flowers and placed them one by one in front of 13 tombstones. With each one I placed, I said, Duppy, Duppy, come to me. A week later, the worst possible thing happened. Uncle Lewis was killed in town by a mugger. The culprit got away and was never found. And just like that, we were burying another relative. I was given the job of placing the shrub on the coffin. I thought about my Uncle Lewis and how I would do anything to see him again. I placed the shrub on his coffin and uttered under my breath, Duppy, Duppy, come to me. We inherited my grandma's house from Uncle Lewis and my sister's mom and I moved in after the funeral. There was a coldness about my grandma's house. It was sad and smelled weird. The lights in some of the rooms didn't turn on and what daylight came in through the windows was dimmed by the large trees outside. My mom became weirdly needy to me and my sisters. I would walk Tanya and Nina home from school and find my mom sitting on the veranda, waiting for us to get home. She smiled and welcomed us, but her eyes wore a secret pain. I think she didn't want to be alone inside the house. At night, the wind had begun to bellow and shake the walls. My mom would cook meals and they would become rotten when she turned her back on them. She dragged a cot into our room to sleep and abandoned her own room altogether. Then one day, my mom confronted me. She asked me, Chan, what direction did you plant the shrub on top of Uncle Lewis? I stammered. The, the way I was supposed to, with the, the roots pointing up. I lied. I see, she said with a calm fury. Pangs of guilt stung my skin. Later that night, the wind got so loud that the rattling of the roof woke me up. My mom and my sisters were sound asleep. I groped through the darkness to the kitchen and poured myself a glass of water. On my way back to the room, the wind built in intensity, and the door to my mom's bedroom began to swing rapidly open and shut. I was too curious to turn away. I peeked through the door, and there was just my mom's empty bed and personal things she hadn't bothered to remove. The trees thrashed violently outside the window. I took a few steps forward until I was standing at the center of the room. The wind erupted into a chorus and whistled louder than ever. I got a knot in my stomach as I smelled something rotten. 
I heard my own teeth chattering and my curiosity turned to pure dread. The closet door creaked ajar and what I saw turned my legs to quivering jelly. A hand with long pointy fingers curled around the closet door. My hands softened. I heard my water glass shatter on the ground. My body pivoted weakly towards the window. The moon came out from behind the clouds and twisting trees and revealed 13 silhouettes standing in the room with me. One for every flower I placed in the graveyard. They bore featureless faces and grinning mouths. Too stunned to run, I fell terrified to the ground, fumbling and clambering awkwardly to the exit on my hands, elbows, and knees. Bony fingers clawed at me and tried to pull me back. They scratched my skin as I struggled loose. A hand grabbed my ankle and almost yanked me away until I kicked for my life. Trembling, I finally scrambled through the door and slammed it shut behind me. The wind moaned in concert with labored gasps as the sound of hands battered the door. I began to weep as I nervously ran back down the hall. Mom, Tanya, Nina, we need to leave this house now. I opened the door to the bedroom where my family slept. In an instant, I felt my whole world drop away beneath me. There on the floor, were the lifeless bodies of Tanya, Nina, and my mom. Above them stood a shadowy figure. It was my Uncle Louis, but his warm eyes and comforting smile were gone, now replaced with a terrifying grin and unearthly stench. He stepped towards me and said, Duppy, Duppy, come to me. Nadia and Justine, new freshmen, were being shown around by Gilda, a junior. She seemed to know everyone and everything about their new high school. Gilda stopped in front of an old storage closet within the girls' locker room, pointing towards the door with peeling paint and an open, rusty lock on it. She told them that every freshman needed to learn about the ghost of Leslie Ann. Nadia drew in a breath, assuring herself out loud, there are no such things as ghosts. Her friend Justine snorted, of course there isn't. She's trying to prank us because we're freshmen. Gilda smirked. You can believe whatever you want to believe, she said. But don't be surprised when you see Leslie Ann. She wants to be best friends forever. She's friends with the ones who mean it and punishes those that don't. It's why she still haunts the school halls. Gilda continued, saying that when Leslie Ann was a freshman, she tried to get in with a really tight click. The group of teenagers humored Leslie Ann's earnest gesture of friendship, but really, they'd roll their eyes behind her back. On the Friday before spring break, they asked Leslie Ann to join in a game of hide and seek after school. Leslie Ann probably thought it was weird since that's more of a kid's game, but she was just glad to be included. When the game began, Leslie Ann ran off to look for the perfect hiding place. They waited for her to leave and then laughing, went the other direction. They didn't give it another thought, sure that she'd figure out the prank when nobody came to find her. Meanwhile, Leslie Ann stumbled across the gym storage closet and hid inside. What she didn't know was that the gym closet often got stuck shut and needed somebody else to open it from the outside. Leslie Ann was trapped in that closet for all of spring break, and that's where she died, alone in that closet. When school resumed, the stench of her corpse lingered for months, even after attempts to scrub the closet clean. Afterwards, the clique began to see Leslie Ann in their dreams. She would follow them around the school until she drove them crazy and made them beg for her friendship. They say that if Leslie Ann sees you and likes you, agree to be her friend. Otherwise, you'll be like the one person from the clique who didn't and was punished. Nadia was captivated. How were they punished? Gilda opened the closet door. Leslie Ann's ghost dragged her into the closet and strangled her. At that moment, the bell rang. Nadia screamed. Justine had grabbed her. Sorry, she said. Don't worry, it's only a story. Sometime later, Nadia sat alone in study hall. She felt herself dozing off in front of her textbook when she heard a girl's voice next to her. I'm new here. Mind if I study with you? It said softly. 
Nadia looked over and saw an emaciated girl. Her flesh looked waxen and rotting. Sunken eyes peered back at her as the girl said, I'm Leslie Ann. Be my friend. Nadia knocked over her chair, running away and into the hall. Don't leave me. Be my friend. Leslie Ann called after her, her voice following her through the halls. As she ran, Nadia heard banging on the hall walls, all around her getting louder and louder, like someone was in the walls trying to claw out. Help, the voice called. Don't leave me, help me, somebody. Nadia jolted awake, panicked. She was still in study hall. It was just a dream. Maybe Justine was right. She was such an easy mark for a scary story. It was time to grow up and stop scaring herself. That night, as Justine was dreaming, she found herself in the school halls. Want to play with me? She heard a voice ask. No, I'm going home, Justine snapped. The voice got nearer. Let's play a game. Be my friend. Determined to make it to the front doors, Justine started running as the mysterious voice began counting down. Three, two, one, ready or not, here I come. No matter how fast she ran, the distance stretched. Finally, she reached the doors and pushed them open to find the decaying cadaver of Leslie Ann reaching for her. You're it. When the girls arrived at school the next morning, Justine grabbed Nadia and they immediately went looking for Gilda. They found her in the locker room. Justine yelled at her. Why did you tell us about the ghost of Leslie Ann? I had terrible nightmares last night. Gilda reminded them they had to promise to be friends forever. The dreams would not stop until they did. Justine didn't even question it. She walked to the door, knocked, and spoke. Leslie Ann, I'm sorry I ran away from you. I'll be your friend. This time, Nadia laughed. Wait, what? But you said it was all just a prank. Justine sighed. Just do it. I don't want us to be haunted, please. Making a face at Gilda and Justine, Nadia rapped lightly on the door. Forgive me, Leslie Ann. Let's be friends. Justine noticed Nadia's fingers crossed behind her back. She looked at her friend, disappointed. You didn't mean it. Of course I didn't, Justine. There are no such things as ghosts, and I don't want the both of you laughing at me again. You're trying to prank me, and this isn't funny. Nadia was on the verge of tears. As Justine and Gilda started to argue with her, the three girls didn't notice as the closet door slowly opened behind her. Two hands appeared out of the darkness and wrapped around Nadia's neck, yanking her into the closet and slamming the door shut. When they were finally able to pry the storage closet open, Nadia was curled up on the closet floor, bruise marks on her neck. Her eyes stared blankly as she whispered over and over again. Leslie Ann, we're best friends forever. Best friends forever. Best friends forever. I spent most of middle school locked in my bedroom with music blaring. My loving home had turned into a battlefield. With my mom and dad arguing nonstop, I was so grateful when my grandma decided to move to South Carolina and live right next door to my parents. My escape to her house felt like a dream. The first thing she did when she moved in was to paint the front door and the ceilings a hint blue. Paint is a Southern or Gula variation meaning hunt. The blue color confuses evil spirits into thinking they're seeing sky or water and causing them to pass right over a house. Grandma always had cool stories like that to share. I would go to her house after school and she would welcome me with hugs and my favorite snacks. She'd tell me stories from when she was young and afterwards we would watch TV together before I was sent home. During one particular bad night at my house, I snuck over to my grandma's to stay the night. She was sound asleep and I didn't want to wake her, so I tiptoed into her guest bedroom and crawled into bed. I tried to sleep but kept tossing and turning. I didn't know if it was because I wasn't used to the quietness or if it was just because I was sleeping in an unfamiliar bed. But either way, something felt strange. I didn't like the closet door that was just the opposite of the bed. It was a small door, barely even noticeable, given that the colors of the door matched the wall. It was filled with old clothes from my grandmother's youth. 
Just as I was about to fall asleep, I heard the closet door creak. My head popped off the pillow. I thought maybe it was just the clothes pressing against the door, but then I heard the handle turn. I flipped on my bedside lamp and I froze. The closet door was now wide open. Seeing that some clothes had fallen off the hangers, I realized I made a big deal out of nothing. With a shaky hand, I turned off the lamp. And that's when I noticed. Against the moonlight, I could make out the shadowy outline of a person. They looked like they were hunched over in the door frame. I tried to turn the light back on, but I was frozen. I watched as a red skeletal figure stalked towards me. As it lurked over me, I could see it had no real face or features. When it climbed on top of me, in my mind, I was clawing, kicking, and screaming. But the truth was, I couldn't move a muscle. It leaned over me, and we were face to face. Summoning all my energy, I opened my mouth and let out a shriek so loud, it pierced my eardrums. But the creature just opened its mouth and took in my scream drinking up all of my breath. I felt life start to drain from my body. I could barely keep my eyes open. And then suddenly, the room lights flipped on. I gasped for air and began coughing. My grandma ran to my side and helped me as I wept in her arms. As soon as my mother discovered I was not in my room, grandma had checked in to see if I was hiding in one of her rooms. I was too upset to even tell her what had happened. I wasn't even sure if it was real. I slept in bed with her the rest of the night. Morning finally came and after a long rest, I was able to tell her what I saw. Her gentle, warm face went pale and cold. It was the boo hag, she said, lowering her voice. She continues saying that some call it a faint. It's an evil spirit manifested over many years. They attack people at night, choking them and taking over their bodies by stealing their breath. It's my fault it attacked you, she said. Shaking her head, she never thought to paint the closet doors the color haint. I told her, no, I was the one who snuck in without asking. If grandma hadn't come in when she did, I, I couldn't even finish my thoughts. It was impossible to bear to think about what might have happened to me. That evening, I helped Grandma paint all the doors inside the house. It made me feel safer, but it still doesn't protect me from my memories of that terrible night. Thanks so much for listening. Like and share if this video gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. See you next time.